Hi, this is Pastor Curtis Smith at Trinity Metropolitan Community Church. Christ's love in the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We are here in Grand Prairie, Texas, and we hope that you look forward to joining us. We'll be sharing scripture and sermon in a moment, and uh, look afterwards for opportunities to join us in ministry, uh, to like us on Facebook, and all those kind of things. We look forward to seeing you here, and uh, I hope that you get something out of this message today. God bless you. When I was in college, I was at a, a student retreat, a Baptist student retreat. I, I was dating a girl at the time. I know that surprises y'all, so, but uh, any, any woman would put up with me for that matter. But um, anyway, I was. We had stayed really late at the at the at the retreat. And you know how college students are; they got to stay up late, and 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 we were. Some of it was studying and praying and and reading and praising God, but other times we were just playing too. But you know how that is, and so. We were leaving because we had to be up the next morning for our respective churches. She taught Sunday school at her church. I was a youth minister at my church. And so we, were, we had to get up early the next morning. So we were driving late that night. And we had spent the whole weekend kind of staying up late and, and not getting enough rest. And here we were driving back. And this was in Falls Creek area, which is in the Arbuckle Mountains of Oklahoma. And we were driving uh, down this way. And suddenly... Out in front of me, I see what looks like a man out in the middle of the road. And he's waving at me, trying to get my attention. And I get closer and I see that, that he's wearing a, a, a jacket. He looks like an African-American man, but I can't really tell for sure. But he's wearing a kind of a long trench coat and he's waving, trying to get my attention. And you have to understand, we were cold in the car. It was, and, and so obviously he's wearing this trench coat to stay warm himself. And it looks like I need to follow him because something's happened. Something's wrong. Either he's trying to direct me on a right path to, to avoid an accident, or he's trying to get me to help him for some reason. So I follow him for a little while ways as he's running in front of me. He, he keeps turning around and looking at me to make sure I know that I'm okay and, and that I'm right behind him. And then suddenly I woke up. I had fallen asleep while driving. Now I don't know what this was that I was seeing. I don't know if it was uh, this angel was there somehow to direct me or guide me. I don't know if I was sleep deprived and, and this was a hallucination. I don't know if it was a ghost or some angelic being that was trying to direct me safely or if it was just my mind and the visions of, you know, the, the middle of the road being a little darker than the other part of the road. Maybe that was this figure somehow moving me and keeping me on track. Was it the hand of God coming to me in, the, in some form that maybe I could understand? Yes, to maybe all above that. Maybe, maybe it was all of those things. I really don't know. I do know that it kept me on the highway. It kept me from being a statistic, running off the embankment of the Arbuckle Mountains and hurting her or myself in the accident. Now, this was before my understanding of this, my, before a vision of this angel. It was before I started watching TV and movies where angels were in overcoats. Now, if you remember some popular angels, you remember Clarence in the uh, wonderful, It's a Wonderful Life. Now, he did actually wear an overcoat, but you, you saw him as an everyman, so you didn't really get that feeling that he was wearing the overcoat for a reason. But then there was the movie City of Angels with Nicolas Gage and Meg Ryan. And, and almost all of the angels were wearing overcoats in that movie. And I remember seeing that thinking about the angel that I must have seen. That he was wearing this trench coat. This overcoat. And here some artistic director decided that's the best way to present these angels. Or Christopher Walker in, as an archangel in the horror type movie called The Prophecy. Or Matt Damon and Ben Affleck in the Kevin Smith movie Dogma. Or John Travolta playing the angelic heartfelt comedy Michael. Almost all of them were wearing trench coats like they had seen my vision or something. <laughs> so imagine if you were asleep at the wheel and you suddenly saw Peter, James, and John, what they saw. Jesus, glorified, transfigured, splendor all along. And alongside your two favorite Bible characters, glorified as well, Moses and Elijah. If God was going to get my attention, 
with two characters from the Bible besides Jesus, obviously. I might have went with Moses. Moses sounds like a good guess. But I would probably ask God probably to send me King David. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about King David. I also heard that he was kind of good looking, so that might be a good thing too. That would probably get my attention. Maybe Abraham or the prophet Isaiah. I, I, I love to read Isaiah's writings. Or maybe that hunky Samson. That would probably be a good one too, right? But what about you ladies? Would you like to know Sarah? What about Ruth, the Moabite woman that was faithful to her mother-in-law and ends up in the lineage of Christ? Or the prophetic judge Deborah? Or Rahab, the accused... Well, I messed that up. Accused prostitute. That later, in the, if you look at the New International, we, for thousands of years now, we've assumed that she was a prostitute. But now the New International has a footnote, the New International Version has a footnote that says she may have just been an innkeeper. Oh, okay. So she was a woman in a man's job, and so now you accuse her of being a prostitute. Well, that makes sense. Maligned all this time in a predominantly male field. What about the New Testament, ladies? What about Mary, the mother of Mary, Mary Christ? Or Mary, Mary, Mary Magdalene? Or maybe Lydia, the seller of purple, who started one of the first New Testament churches in her home and then later by the riverside. Or what about us guys again? Peter, James, John, or Paul? Any of those characters from the New Testament, those would get our attention. Now, obviously, we don't really know any of those people. We've had some paintings and some artistic renditions, but that really doesn't help us know what they looked like. Imagine, here these guys were, Peter, James, and John, waking up from their afternoon sleepy nap. They're startled to see Jesus in this uh, glorified form, and then they personally see Moses and Elijah, yet they didn't really know Moses and Elijah. They knew Jesus, but they didn't know Moses and Elijah. But somehow in their spirits, they knew who he was, who they were. Asleep at the will. Were they dreaming? Were their minds playing tricks on them? Were they sleep deprived and having a hallucination? Or was this an act of the Almighty trying to clarify who Jesus was to them? Verse 31 says, They were all glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. That was the theme of this message. And God, from the voice above, says, This is my child, whom I love. Listen to him. Yet their spirits were still asleep. They don't realize the reality that's being revealed to them. Jesus is the Son of God. Great. Great. Communing with the two of the, the, the founding ancestors of their faith. That's awesome. Talking about Jesus being the fulfillment of the laws and the prophecies. Terrific. This Jesus that they've been traveling with for the last few years. And yet still Peter in his sleepy state wants to treat Jesus as an equal to Moses and Elijah. And God says no. No. This is my only begotten son. This is the fulfillment of all that I'm going to do. The relationship I want to have with all of Hebrew people and all of the world. This is how I'll show the world that I love them. But you know what? Today's church is like the disciples. We're all asleep at the wheel. We're missing out on what God is wanting to do in our generation right here. Right now, there are so many defining moments where Christ is being revealed and God's mission is to reach out and include others in the be that are being missed out and we're missing out on that opportunity. But this isn't the only time that the disciples were spiritually asleep at the will. When they came down from this mountaintop experience, they came across the other disciples and followers of Jesus who were also spiritually asleep, and they, can't, they couldn't even heal a simple demon-possessed person. And Jesus sort of chastised them of having too little faith. Now, I'd like to stop here just a minute. I, I want to talk about, sometimes in the Bible, we confuse and mislabel people who have mental health issues. 
and 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 maybe a, and always say that they're demon possessed and demon oppression. And I believe demon possession and oppression is real. I, I don't understand it. I believe that in Christ and because Christ is in me that I don't have to worry about that. And, and because Christ is in you, you don't have to worry about that. But we need to keep ourselves aligned with Christ. But what I want to address is mental health and substance abuse and addiction. And for many of your stories, you've told me and you shared with me some of your addictions, some of your struggles with your mental health, some of the substance abuse things that you've been through. But I think the churches in our world are asleep regarding mental health in our churches. I think our churches are asleep regarding abuse in the church. Regarding suicide and the stigmas around mental health. Ignoring substance abuse and addictions. Delaying sometimes getting professional help and care and the medicines that they might need. I believe that we need to be working in the church to better our relationships and, and help our relationships be more secure. And, and the counseling that goes around that. And, and what a wonderful gift it is that we, Trinity MCC, support the Together in Texas pre-marriage counseling course and offer it free to people. And I, I had a couple this weekend that just, it was a wonderful opportunity for them to get to know each other a little bit better and more soundly before their wedding. In 2013, super pastor Rick Warren, the writer of the Purpose Driven Life series, you've probably heard of him. Him and his wife lost their 27-year-old son to suicide. He had battled mental health most all of his teens. And in the recent months, uh, recently then after that, he committed suicide. And also recent months, we re recently heard about a pastor, Isaac Hunter, the son of the spiritual advisor for President Obama. And he reportedly took his own life. Or another mega church pastor, Joel Hunter's influence, um, was his, his father. In November, a pastor in Georgia killed himself between two morning services. Had one early morning service, and but before the next morning service, he killed himself. The Schaefer Institute reports that 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates will leave the ministry within five years. Part of it is the disillusionment and the stress of the ministry. But I believe mental health is also a factor. And the church is asleep when we think about mental health. This first month of Tuesday, the first Tuesday of this month, we'll be having our grief and trauma support group. We have that every first Tuesday. But I'd also like to recommend that we have the second Tuesday on something called mental health support. And so Tuesday the 5th will be our grief and trauma support. And Tuesday the 12th, we're going to start advertising our mental health support. Amen. Amen. But the church offering support classes really isn't enough. I believe the church is asleep at the wheel when it comes to mental health. I was reading in Numbers chapter 16 and 17 and I was seeing uh, about the spiritual rebellion of the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and God had warned Moses and his brother Aaron about this rebellion and God was going to destroy them all. And Moses and Aaron fell down on their faces, fell down prostrate before God, and they were praying and begging God not to do this. And then Aaron got up and ran to the altar and grabbed an incense burner and started running through the crowd with this incense burner. And wherever the cloud of incense was purifying the people, there the plague that God had sent stopped. But if the cloud didn't get to the people, the plague attacked, it, attacked them and killed them. I believe today's incense, the cloud that we're supposed to be spreading around our world today, is our prayers, folks. Our prayers are that incense. And the cloud of incense hovering over our community in prayer for mental health, for depression, for suicide, for substance abuse, for addiction, especially in the LGBTQ community. I believe the church is largely asleep at the wheel when it comes to that. And we should not be Trinity. We should be praying for that. But back to our story in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus rebukes them for being spiritually asleep, and then he brings on the healing for this demon-possessed boy. That should be enough to wake you up. I mean, you see a demon-possessed person not demon-possessed anymore. That should be enough to wake you up. But no, our passage says that all gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. 
While everyone was marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Listen to me and remember what I say. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the hands of his enemies. But then it says, But they didn't know what he meant. The significance of this was all hidden from them. And yet they were afraid to ask. They were really basically still asleep. Even though the crowd was in awe, it still was enough for the crowd to continually follow Jesus. Even though they had this awe, it was still basically at a distance. They were still spiritually asleep. The disciples who were following Jesus were still spiritually asleep. They couldn't understand the significance of all of this. The eternal salvation was going to come through Christ and be offered to all of humanity, and they didn't get it. They were still asleep at the wheel. But other areas of the church are also asleep at the wheel. Recently, our United Methodist Churches, as I said earlier, they voted to not fully accept their LGBTQ members and pastors into full inclusion. But even in our own denomination, the MCC denomination, it's still not fully embracing the gift that we have of full inclusion. We're the ones who started it, and yet we're not in the leaders of it, like we should be. We're not doing enough to offer to the world and other denominations and individual churches th that are pulling ahead of us. We're not offering enough, and we're still struggling with power in our own little denomination, and we lose more of our focus when we're not putting our focus on the power of Christ instead. I've been doing some ancestor search lately, and uh, uh, for my birthday, I got me one of those DNA tests to, to kind of do your ancestor thing. Now, I still haven't got it back, so I don't know exactly where we're all from, but part of that was including that you could kind of do your family tree. And I haven't really known much about my father's family tree. I, I really don't. My father's side, the Smith side, I, I, I just knew Grandpa Smith, and, and he died when my dad was 14, so I really didn't know much about that, and my dad didn't know much about that to tell us anymore. They weren't really good at keeping up with the Smith side, maybe because Smith is such a common name. I don't know. But with modern technology and you can link yourself up with other family trees on this little website, one of my Smith relatives comes to find out was a Smythe when they first came to Boston with one of some of the earlier settlers of Boston. Now, it wasn't quite the Mayflower crowd, but he was still soon after. And then backing past him from the old world... It seems likely that he might have been kin to the godfather of Shakespeare. Now you know why my sermons are so wrong, long, right? <laughs> What's in a name that we will call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? <laughs> the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. <laughs> Those are some of my quotes from Shakespeare, if you'd like that. <laughs> but on my mother's side, the Bowman family tree, we always sort of assumed that we could trace it back if we really made the effort. But guess what? I can only trace back to my great-great-grandfather, Reverend James Wiley Bowman. That's as far as I can go. He served as an evangelist in Chico, Wise County, Texas, just not far from Decatur, in the Methodist Episcopal Church at the time, the Methodist Episcopal Church South. On his tombstone, it, has this, it says that. It's right there. And his first and second wife were also both, both born, are both buried there in Chico. Who knew that he was so close? We just assumed they were somewhere off somewhere else. There's a record of him being at a Methodist Episcopal uh, Church uh, convention uh, at uh, the General Convention, and they were meeting at the Oaklawn Methodist Church. Some of you may know where that is, right, in Dallas. That was in 1921, and there's a record of him being in attendance there. He dies five years later. He was born in Alabama, but I can't find who his parents were. That's all I know. He served in the Confederate Army of Tennessee, and that's where I started to get a little shocked. Generationally, my family, I never knew my family to be really racist. But here was proof, at least somewhat. Now, technically, you could argue that he was fighting for partly the state's rights and so forth. And geographically, he was a part of the South, and this was part of his cultural upbringing. But the Methodist Episcopal Church South, he was a minister, but yet they intentionally split off from the Methodist Church in 1844, a couple of decades before the Civil War, because of the racial and slavery. 
this led to start the Methodist Episcopal South group to break off from their other denomination. Again, he could have been just a product of his environment. And the Methodists came back together in 1939 to form now that what was now understood as the United Methodist Church. But that was 16 years after his death. So historically, I don't know the man. I never read his writings, if there are any out there that still survive. I don't know any stories about him. But, but, but as I'm looking at this, I, it does make me a little sick. I know I don't really have a real connection to him. But racial equality is still happening around our world today. And I can see directly that I had something to do with it. White nationalism and the Confederate pride is still raising its ugly head. The KKK is, isn't some dark history book anymore. It's still right here. And I wonder about my part in it. My advantages just because of the color of my skin. I'm also awakened as I'm talking about my highs and lows of discovering my heritage. I become acutely aware that the guy that I'm seeing barely knows his father and is black. And if he was to do the same thing that I was doing, he wouldn't get very far on his family tree at all. And that if we did go too far back, we might see that maybe one of my family members owned one of his family members. How horrible would that be? And the fact that I live in a community that still struggles with racism... And that I'm part of an LGBT community that is often estranged from their families because of bigotry and, and all that and, and not including the right to love who they want to love. Now speaking of the Methodists, the Methodists came around finally when they brought together over the racial issues. I believe that someday they'll come together over the LGBTQ welcoming of their sisters and brothers there. But we need to continue to pray for those wounded by this most recent vote. And pray for those who are in power that made it happen so that they will repent. But yet we also need to be taking the message to those who still don't know that they belong. But am I asleep? Am I doing enough to welcome and love my neighbor who is black or Middle Eastern or Latin or Asian or Native American? My neighbor from a different religious background. Am I doing enough to welcome them? Have I been, like many in the church, asleep at the wheel of what God wants to do to increase this diverse family, this rainbow family of God? Is my denomination, the MCC churches, are they doing enough to hear the voices of others? When the majority is accused of being racist, they shouldn't spend all their time defending, excusing, and justifying. They should listen, repent, correct, they should be transformed. The MCC model is BMCC, transforming ourselves as we transform the world. And I'd like to think that we are trying to live up to it, but we've got a long ways to go, folks. What is God trying to wake up in your life to stir you up from your slumber? Bill Hybels is a pastor. He wrote a book called The Holy Disconnect. Or, excuse me, Holy Discontent. So what really sets you off? What are the things in your life that kind of just get your blood boiling? In his book, uh, Heibel says that uh, he tries to use his influence as a pastor. It's talking about the holy disconnect, discontent. And it's sort of this idea that the things that we're dis distressed about the most, that that might be a God-given righteous indignation about something. That we should be channeling our energies toward positive directions about these things that bother us the most. On the back cover, it says, Hybels invites you to consider the dramatic impact your life will have when you willingly allow God to convert the frustration of your holy discontent into fueling a change for the world. He discussed Moses and the discontent that Moses had for his own people and being slaves there in Egypt and how God used him to lead him to, and, the, and the rest of the Jewish people into the promised land. Or the work of Martin Luther King Jr. as an example of someone starting something he could stand no more and seeing this that he couldn't stand anymore and he was affecting change with God's help.
Heibel says, truly there's nothing more inspiring than a person who transforms something he or she can't just stand anymore into a kind of positive energy that advances restoration into the world. That is what is at work every time a check gets sent with a grateful heart to a worthy cause, all in the name of doing good in the world. It's what's at work every time a person steps into a church or a civic center or a relief agency and says, I'm here to serve with that attitude and does so after logging 40 or 60 or even 80 hours of work at their real job each week. It's also what's at work when people work at their jobs not just for a paycheck, but it see it as an avenue for releasing a little pent-up holy discontent. Do you see some real problems around you in our world? Do they bother you and disturb you? That's possibly the holy discontent. If you can do nothing else, at least pray. Pray. Seek God's guidance and direction. Pray for others. Pray for Trinity MCC. Pray for me as your pastor. Then wake up and allow God to move you. The disciples didn't get woke up until at least Pentecost, after Jesus' crucifixion, His death, and His resurrection. But when they did get woke up, they were used by God mightily. The Apostle Paul tells his church in Galatia, in Galatians 6, 9, he says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. We often look to the verse in Hebrews chapter 10 that says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Are you asleep in some way? Allow God to wake you up. We're going to have an opportunity to come forward for an invitation. This is a time for renewal. This is a time for reflection and restoration. You may want to just pray where you are. You might want to come and ask me to pray with you. You may want to come and repent. Whatever God is asking you to do in this moment, this is the time.